Let's see your Bibles this morning. Word. Let's see your pens and your bulletin, nothing plan, notebook. Okay, great. Turn to Genesis 37. Genesis 37. Guys, excited to be in church? Good, good, good. Who's the man this morning? Jesus. Jesus. All you people sitting in the lobby, who's the man? <laughs> All right. Okay, hold on. We got another group out in uh, Casa Real. Everyone in Casa Real, who's the man? We heard you, we heard you, we heard you. One day in practice, um, one of our kids on our team, this is a while back, um, we put him in at receiver, and he, we don't really throw the ball to him a lot. I didn't at the time throw the ball to him a lot. And he's always asking for the ball. So I said, okay, this is for you. I'm going to throw you the ball. He's all, he got all excited. So you better run the route right catch the ball. So he ran the route, threw him the ball. And the defensive back who was guarding him knocked the ball on the ground, threw him on the ground. <laughs> he's like, oh, man. He's like, bomb came back, and I told him, look, that's football. That's normal. He did his job. Get in the huddle. We're going to do it again. Sometimes, doesn't it feel like the devil knocks the ball down and throws it on the ground? <laughs> Takes your whole life, bam, throws you on the ground, stomps you, and walks away. <laughs> we call trials or hard times, amen? We all have been there and will be there again. So for the next two weeks, I want to talk about going through trials, the title of the message is, It's All Good. It's all good. And we're going to talk about a guy named Joseph. We're going to read a story about trials he's been through and how he reacted in the midst of his trial. Before we do that, I just want to give you a little prep. See, it says preparation for trials. This, this first side of the lesson plan, we're just going to give you a little prep before we start. First thing it says, number one, plan with the end in mind, the end, E-N-D, in mind. If you ever plan a business, our church, school, miles ahead, all businesses, the ministry businesses, we have to plan and strategize and budget with the end in mind. Where are we going? Are we going to buy a building, which we are, and it's, it's, keep praying for that, it's going fine, it's taking slow, but it's, it's moving forward. Are we going to buy a building, are we going to put a school in it? Little school, big school, how big, how many kids, cafeteria, bookstore, food court. We have to think about what do we want this to look like in the end. Then we have to think about what do we want San Diego to look like as a result of this church being in existence. All that will dictate what we do now. Same thing with your life. If you know trials are going to come sometime, you may not know exactly what they are, but you still can plan with how you want to react when they do happen. You still can decide that now. If you lost your job, how would you like to react? If the people, the people you may be, or, or the person you may be dating, you may be dating people, I don't know, but the person you may be dating, you know, maybe it's not, it's shaky. Well, if they left you, how would you like to be able to deal with it? If you uh, all of a sudden didn't make the money you wanted to make or your income went down, how would you like to be able to deal with that? You can plan that now. So plan with the end of mind. Two, do not wait for hard times to come to get ready for them. Don't say, well, I'm going to wait till I lose my job. Then I'll think about it then. Well, I'm going to wait till my girlfriend breaks up with me because she ain't going to because I'm the man, so I ain't going to have to worry about it. <laughs> okay? You want to plan now. You don't want to wait till that stuff happens. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Benigo and Daniel got kidnapped, they went through some hard times, but they had already made a commitment to God before they were kidnapped. Before they were deported to Babylon, they had already made a commitment. So when the hard times came, they were ready for it. If you wait till you get in a situation where you're tempted to think about a strategy, you'll probably fail. There's a frog in Costa Rica called a tomato frog. It's red. And when a tomato frog is attacked, something's going to eat it. It leaks out all over its body this white milky poison. So whatever's chewing it up will spit it out. 
The only problem is it's already chewed up. <laughs> that's, that's a messed up plan. <laughs> you know, it, it's still alive, but it's hopping like this now, you know. Can't, can't hop. So many of us are walking around like this spiritually because we didn't have a plan until it was too late. Okay? And if you wait till the trial comes to have a plan, when the trial ends, your plan will end. Your discipline will end. Next one. Hard times are the best learning opportunities of our lives. The best learning opportunities. Hebrews 12, 11. No discipline or chastening seems to be joyful for the present. Hmm. Duh. But painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. When you're going through trials, they don't seem to be a lot of fun. But if you're trained by it, if you learn from it, it'll yield a fruit of righteousness in your life. But if you just deal with it and be tough and be macho uh, and you want to be, you know, I'm just going to deal with it, which is wrong, you need to surrender to God. If you try to deal with it on your own, you'll probably go through it again or something similar because you haven't learned a lesson. Lesson number one is about your need of Christ and surrender to him. Okay? So they're, they're very good learning opportunities. Number four. Life is not defined by one incident. Your life and your identity and your future and who you are is not defined by one incident. If you get dumped by somebody, that doesn't mean you're the ugly duckling of San Diego. <laughs> if you lose your job, doesn't mean you're never going to get another job. If you can't buy a house, doesn't mean you're never going to be able to buy a house. I remember, you know, when I was young, going to a party, 10, 11, 12 and they were dancing at the party, and I just couldn't get it. <laughs> Remember those days? <laughs> of course, now Soul Train's calling, but that's a different story. <laughs> but as a kid, you know, you just you, you can't get it, and you, you don't want to be the, 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 the goofball out there. So I just stood on the side and just didn't dance. And at the time, you're feeling like you're going to be an outcast all your life. That's not the case. Okay, so one incident does not define who you are. So if you're going through something bad now, that's not who you are. Even if you've been through five bad things, your life is defined by your life. That's what defines who you are. Everybody who's successful, everybody that you know who's successful, whether personally or on television, everybody has had ups and downs. It's part of life. But the ones who succeed in the end are the ones who stick it out and look at the big picture. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and gets up again, gets up again. Walter Payton was one of my favorite running backs. Uh, as a matter of fact, when he, I couldn't believe that he even died. I mean, I know everyone's going to die, but to see him die at such a young age, it's like his nickname, if you don't know who he is, is a running back. His name is, what's his new nickname? Sweetness. <laughs> That's a nickname right there. When, when your peers call you Sweetness, because he was just whew, ridiculous. He was, he was good. Um, but you know what? Walter Payton got knocked down every game many times. He just got up again. Now, he probably laid out four dudes before he ended up getting knocked down. <laughs> but he did get knocked down every game over and over. And every time he got back up, went to the huddle and did it again. More times than anybody else ever. Um, next one. Hard times never seem to be fair or bearable. Hmm. God, this is not right. Look what it says, 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Whatever you've been through, whatever you're going through, whatever you're going to go through, guess what? You're not the only one. Matter of fact, if you're going through something right now, chances are there's somebody right here in this room who's going through the same thing you're going through right now. Or definitely has been through it before. The good news about that is you're not the only one. God hasn't just singled you out. And there's other people who've been through it, and guess what? They made it through. Okay. Learning more lessons. The Bible says no temptation is overtaking you except such as common to man. Then it says, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with every temptation will also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear underneath it. Every time you go through something, guess what God says? I'm still here. 
And there's a way out. You just got to find it. And many times it's right here. It's just for us to make a decision to surrender our life to Christ. And you may be saved. I'm talking about surrendering your life to Christ. Like, I'm, I'm yours. Not that you're a Christian by name, you go to church, but no God, here I am. It's all right here. You remember the Wizard of Oz? Remember Dorothy? Anybody? Yeah. Remember she, the house fell on the, uh, the witch? Dorothy gets knocked out, she goes into this long dream, and, she, and then the fairy, um, godmother, Glenda, is that her name? She comes floating down. Remember? Remember that girl? She had the big white dress on. She was pale, wasn't she? <laughs> that girl was white. And she came down. She said, oh, Dorothy, Dorothy. And she told us some story, I remember. And Dorothy went through the, the yellow brick road, all the lions, tigers, and bears, and the Wizard of Oz, and the Wicked Witch of the, who, the West or the East or whatever. And, and the melting, melting. She went through all of that. She gets the broom. Are you with me? She gets the broom and goes through all of that. And then the fairy comes back in the bubble and says, Dorothy, all you ever had to do was click your heels. Now, I would have been smacking that lady. Amen? <laughs> Why did you tell me that in the beginning of the movie? <laughs> and many times we go through all of this stuff to try to fix our problems when the problem is really designed to fix us. You say, God, what do you want me to do? Oh, just repent. Your problem may not go away right away but a lot of your misery will. And if you don't have misery, guess what? You probably don't really have a problem. <laughs> Turn the page. Now, so that's background. Trials aren't fair. You got to plan with the end in mind. You got to not wait till trials to come to get ready for them. You're not, your life is not defined by one incident. If someone here is a surgeon, anybody here a surgeon? Anybody here? Anybody here ever cut anybody open? <laughs> okay, we're get that. Um, if you ever look at a surgeon and go and watch a surgeon do surgery, if that was all their life was, they'd be kind of a strange person just to cut people open. But there's a lot more to it. There's a diagnosis. There's surgery. There's treatment. There's an education process that person goes through. You, your life is not defined by one, one, one incident. So here's Joseph. We're going to look at Joseph go through an unfair, apparently, trial, an unbearable, apparent trial, and we're going to see how he reacts. And we're going to learn lessons this week and next week from him to guide us and direct us as we prepare for stuff we might go through. Okay, first thing, the, Bible says, the lesson plan says, Joseph at 17 years old share his, shares his dream with his family. In chapter 37, he tells his mother, his father, his brothers, all of y'all one day are going to bow down to me, <laughs> basically. He has a dream. Now, God can communicate to you through a dream. Not all your dreams are from God, but God can communicate to you through dreams. All through the Bible, he does with people. Uh, four months ago, I had a dream that my Little League coach, who lived three doors down from me, who was my friend's dad, had cancer. And I remember crying because God was like reminding me of how much this man meant to me because he was my first coach. I've known him all my life. I never told him thank you. So I went home this summer. I went to New York this summer, and I went to his house. And I haven't seen him in 20 years. And his wife answered the door, and she's like, you know, Miles? I said, yeah, I remember I lived right three doors down. <laughs> and I said, asked him, was Mr. McNeil home? And he was in, in his bed, and he yells, come run out. We start hugging each other. And I said, Mr. McNeil, I had a dream that you were sick and you had cancer. And he says, I do. I have prostate cancer. And he's going to be okay, I believe. But, you know, that was out of the blue. And God can, can communicate to you through dreams. He told Joseph, Joseph? Through this dream, your family's going to bow down to you. Now, his brothers didn't like him anyway. His brothers didn't like him anyway. Look what he says in verse 10. It says, 37.10, he told to his father and his brothers, and his fathers rebuked him and said, what is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to you and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So first thing, Joseph has his dream. 
God spoke to him. He tells his family, no big deal. Next thing, we see that his brothers sold him into slavery. Look at verse 20. They started coming up with a scheme how to get rid of him. And it says, come let us now therefore and kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. These are some real good brothers. We shall see what will come of his dreams. But Reuben, his brother, heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said, shed no blood, but cast him into a pit which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. He's trying to save him. Verse 23. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers, they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. The tunic of many colors was a gift from his dad that only he had. So they, they didn't like him for that also. It showed favoritism. Verse 24. They took him, cast him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. They sat down to eat a meal. <laughs> some cold-hearted dudes. Get in that pit, boy. Let's go have some food right here. <laughs> they lifted up their eyes and looked. There was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bringing spices, balm, myrrh on their way to carry them to Egypt. So Judah, one of the brothers, said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? We're not going to get anything if we kill him. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our flesh. Let's treat him good. And his brothers listen. You know what they said? Hey, if we kill him, we don't get anything. Why don't we sell him into slavery? You know, he's our brother. We shouldn't treat him that bad. We'll just sell him into slavery. <laughs> this is what they're saying. So he said, yeah, that's not only a good idea. We could go home and be innocent. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took him to Egypt. Is that fair? Has any of you ever been sold by your brothers or sisters of slavery to Egypt? No. <laughs> so we see Joseph, 17 years old. God gives him a dream. He shares his dream. His brothers sell him into slavery. And then it gets even worse. In verse 36, it says, The Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, a captain of his guard. So here we got Joseph is sold by his brothers, traumatic. They throw him in the pit, traumatic. They sell him to these uh, merchants. They take him to Egypt, traumatic. Then they, he gets sold again to an officer of Pharaoh. So now he's in Pharaoh's house. Here's the question. What would you do? Did you have an attitude? Did you blame God? Did you get depressed? Would you start worrying? Start whining? Stop reading your Bible? Stop praying? What would you do? Because all of y'all have been through stuff, and some of y'all are in stuff right now, what are you doing? We're going to see what Joseph does. Look in your lesson plan. The first thing you have to understand is you have to expect God's continued blessing. This is what the devil does not want you to know or think about. When you are in the middle of a trial, God's love has not been removed from your life. God is still looking at you. He still has his eye on you. He still wants you to serve him, and he still wants to bless you. Now, just because you're in a trial, the devil wants you to think that God is mad at you, and he is 100% against you, and nothing you will do is going to work. He wants you to think that God has removed his love from you, that he's turned his back on you. That is not true. If God removes his love from you and turns his back on you, you have no hope. You're done. But the fact that you're even alive, that you can... Create an intelligent thought, still go to work, still love your kids, feed your kids. The fact that you can still do that is a sign of God's blessing because without it, you couldn't do that. God's still in the midst of your trial, in the midst of what you don't want to happen, which is a trial, something we don't want to happen. God still wants to bless you, and you have to look for it. Look what it says in verse 2, verse 1 and 2, verse, uh, chapter 39, chapter 39. It says, Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. Everyone say the Lord was with Joseph. And he was a successful man, and he was in the house of the master, of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. 
and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, sold twice. He's in a foreign land, foreign culture, foreign currency, foreign language. And yet God was still with him. How many of you have been through, don't raise your hand, just think about it. How many of you have been through stuff and say, God, why me? Why is this happening to me? Why are you against me? God's saying, I'm still with you, though. I still want to bless you. Stop focusing on what you don't want to happen, thinking it's the end of the world, thinking your life is over because of this one incident. What about all the other aspects of your life? What about your friends, your family, your job, your, your dreams, your goals? It's still there. It's still there. So don't let the devil distract you by this one apparent disaster. God says he was still with him. God says he was still with him. In your lesson plan, write this down. It says Joseph worked faithfully. He worked faithfully. You got some problems? You still got to go to work. You got problems? You still got to be mom. You got problems? You still got to be dad. You still got to feed your kids, still got to go to work, still got to be boss, still got to be a student. You're in school. You got a little problem over here. Your teacher don't want to hear that. He wants you to do the work. You got to work faithfully. Don't let the devil distract you from what God has put before you. And guess what? Even your trial may bring new work into your life. Do that work faithfully. Do that work faithfully. Not only was, was God with Joseph, but God blessed Joseph, and it was evident to his boss. His boss says, man, it is so plain to me that God is blessing you that because your work is so much efficient and so more blessed than all the other people I have. Hmm. Many times we are so preoccupied with fixing our trial that we forget that our trial is designed to fix us. Ooh. <laughs> oh, yes. You're, you're so preoccupied. I got to fix this problem. Now, I'm not saying you don't try to fix your trials, but you can't abandon everything else. Because God's going to fix you through you being faithful with what he's called you to do. So if, he, if, you, if you lost your job and you say, well, I'm not going to be a mom until I get another job, well, guess what? You just failed. You still got to be a mom. God will, and, you, and you, you pursue your job. When you have time to get your job, at, 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 at the same time being a good mom, God's going to bless you. He wants you to be faithful. Joseph said, you know what? I've been sold. This guy owns me. He wasn't preoccupied with going home. He says, I'm going I'm to do my job very good what's in front of me. I'm going to do what's good in front of me. Some of you may be in a company or the military or whatever, and you don't have the job you want. Someone else has a job you want. And to you, that's a trial. You don't like the job you have. You want that job. You have two choices. Well, you have several choices. One, you can quit. Two, you can be so preoccupied about getting that job that you don't do the job that you'll be given. And thus you fail at this job and get fired. Or you can start manipulating people and lying, cheating, and stealing so you can get that job. If you do that, you know what you're going to do when you get that job? You're going to manipulate, try, lie, cheat, and steal to get another job. What you need to do is be faithful with the job you have. That's what you need to do. That's what Joseph was. Look at the third, a, a B. In your lesson plan, it's to write down, Joseph served faithfully. He served faithfully. Therefore, God blessed his relationship with his boss, who gave him full authority over all he had. It's all good if you honor those God brings into your life. Let's look what it says in verse 4. Joseph found favor in his sight. And served him. Then he made him overseer of his house, and all that he had he put under his authority. So it was from the time that he had made him overseer of his house and all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Through your trial, God is going to bring people into your life. Don't bash them. Bless them. Hmm. You may get arrested for doing something wrong, and you're mad at the cops. Don't get mad at the cops. Bless the cops and put your hands behind your back. <laughs> if your trial brings you into contact with people, I was sick in the hospital. When I was sick in the hospital for two days, a few years ago, four or five years ago, 
And I remember being in the hospital, and God brought nurses in the room, brought doctors in the room. God said, you know what, you wouldn't meet these people unless I was with you and brought you here. He says, these are people you need to bless. These are people you need to pray for. These are people you need to encourage. I remember getting wheeled out of the hospital. This guy took me, he had a, they had to take me on a wheelchair to the door, and then I had to walk to the car. And I remember he, him wheeling me out, and I was inviting him to church. He says, listen, I got you here. I don't want you to forget me. If God brings you, because of your trial, people into your life, don't start venting on them and blaming them. You start blessing them. And you have to decide that today. That when something happens and you find yourself in a place you don't want to be with, people you don't want to be with, oh, okay, what do I do? What do I do? A cop attitude? Do I get grumpy? How many of us can get grumpy? <laughs> we got some grumpled still skins in here now. <laughs> I don't get my way. <laughs> <laughs> you like them dudes on Wizard of Oz? Remember? <laughs> <laughs> we are the fucking of our kids. Lollipop. <laughs> no, you don't get grumpy. You say, you know what? I want to bless you. I want to serve you. Even though I don't feel like it. <laughs> I'm not happy. I'm not getting my way. But you know what? If you're in my life, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to encourage you. God is going to honor you. Look what it says in verse, verse 5. So it was from the time that he made him overseer of his house and all that he had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake and blessed the Lord. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. God's blessing. God's blessing. Your job through thick and thin, hard times and good times, is to bless the people in your life. Bless the people in your life. The Bible says love even your enemies. Oh, it's easy to love your friends. Love those who talk behind your back. Love those who, who spitefully use you. Love them. Encourage them. Pray for them. Ugh, I don't want to do that. That's too bad. That's what the Bible says. Thirdly, Joseph honored God faithfully. Joseph honored God faithfully and resisted his master's wife. Therefore, God promoted him. It's all good if you don't use hard times as an excuse to compromise your faith. Let's read verse 7. Chapter 39. Came to pass <clears throat> after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. These are longing eyes. <laughs> I was... I was at football practice recently, and this little 10-year-old girl that I've only met one time said hi to her. She just walks up to me and puts her arm around me. <laughs> so I put my arm around her and said, what's your name? <laughs> She's just like, I was like, is this something I don't know? <laughs> but this woman, she's like, Joseph. <laughs> Look what it says. And she said, the lady in the Bible, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not know what is with me in, in the house, and he has committed all that he has in my hand, to my hand. There is not, no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept anything back from you, but from me, but you, because you are his wife. How then can I do this wickedness and sin against God? Whatever you're going through, it does not give you license to sin against God in any way. You can't say, well, I'm going through hard times, so you know what? I'm not going to read my Bible today. I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to be kind today. I'm not going to be patient today. That's the very time you really need to be doing that even more. When you're in hard times, that's when God wants you to get on your knees more and stay there. The problem is the trial goes away, we get off our knees. This is the time you need to cling to God even more. He says, God forbid I should sin against God. Look what he says in verse 10. So it was she spoke to Joseph day by day, day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her or be with her. Fellas, we're not talking about one time, how you doing? We're not talking about 
oh, honey, you know, our eyes locked and something happened. It was magical and I just couldn't help myself. No, 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 no. That's not good enough excuse. She was day by day, lie with me, lie with me, lie with me. He's like, get out of here, woman, get out of here. Get. He, he, he constantly, day, now I don't know how much of a player you are, but I doubt someone's pestering you day by day by day. So don't use the excuse, well, you know, you know, I just couldn't help it because we were at work together and, you know, we were just in a place and it just happened. Oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. <laughs> no. The same thing for you women, too. You know, you know, he was just so cute and it was the moon was in the, the sun and I just couldn't help it. It was just, <gasps> no, no. It gets even better or worse, however you want to look at it. Verse 11 but it happened about this time when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men were in the house that she caught him by the garment. This is why it's, it's so, you should be careful about who you are alone with and where. She grabbed him by his clothes and said, lie with me. <laughs> but he, I mean, this is, this is four word but he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran. <laughs> run, Forrest, run. <laughs> Even if a woman pesters you day after day after day, even if a woman traps you in the room, you still can run. God says, I'll, <laughs> even if she grabs your garment, remember the Bible says God will always provide a way out. Many times the way out is just to run. It really is. What do I do? I don't know. Everyone's getting high. Run. Everyone's going to rob a store. Run. I mean, you can run now and run when the cops come. You're going to be running, though. <laughs> run. <laughs> the sad thing is that he still gets busted because she lies. Let's look. Let's keep reading. So, verse 13, so it was when she had saw that he left his garment in her hand and she got rejected. She got the Heisman. Bam. And fled outside. She called to the men of our house and spoke to them, saying, see, he has brought us into us a Hebrew to mock us. He came into me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. She's lying. And it happened when she heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. She's lying. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home, her husband, and she spoke to him with the words like these, saying, the Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came into me to mock me. She's lying. So it happened as I lifted up my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me and fled outside. She's lying. So it was when his master heard these words, which, was, which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. In verse 20, Joseph's master took him, put him in prison, a place where the king's prisons were confined, and he was in prison. Man, the brother has a dream. I have a dream. And one day, all y'all going to bow down to me. They throw him in the pit. They take him out of the pit. They sell him. He gets sold again. He serves this man, bless him. He serves faithfully. His wife lies. And he gets thrown in prison. What's the brother supposed to do? Depressed, blame God, get mad, compromise his faith. Nope. Look what it says in there. And see, Joseph honored God faithfully. He honored God faithfully. What the devil intends for evil, God intends for good. When you go through a trial, how you grow through it, how you deal with it, how much of God you experience in it is all up to you. It's all up to you. Don't you think that any time God could just whoop, make things better? God could change the whole world and take all the sin out of the world if he wanted to. It's not what he does. He is allowing you to walk down that road, and he is with you the whole time. He's with you the whole time. He wants you to honor him. 
He wants you to serve the people that are around you. He wants you to work faithfully. Do what he set before you. Be faithful in your devotion. Be faithful in your, in your praying, in your serving. When you get busy, oh, I don't have time for God. You need to make time for God. When you get broke, oh, I can't tithe. You need to tithe. When you, when, you, when you have a busy schedule, I can't pray. You need to pray. When I got pressure, I don't have time to pray. You need to pray even more. That's when you need to seek God more. And God is sitting back watching, seeing what you're going to do. And in this story, we see a guy, he got done wrong. Yet he was faithful. He's faithful to his master. He's faithful to God. He was faithful to resist the woman. He could have easily said, man, you know, I, I'm down here. I, I'm, I got power. I'm the most powerful. Maybe I could take the king's wife or my, my boss's wife and take his job. <laughs> no. He says, you know what? God is watching me. Even though we're the only ones in this room, God is watching me. Have you ever thought you were all by yourself? Don't be so stupid. Remember Adam and Eve? Remember Adam? Adam, where are you? He can't find me behind this rock. Please. When God was asking Adam where he was, he was not asking Adam, where are you hiding? That's not what he was asking. He was asking Adam this question. Adam, you did exactly what I told you not to do. Did it make you any better than you were before? That's what he was asking him. Are you any more powerful, richer, more important, more happy now that you did what I told you? That's what he was asking. Where are you on this ladder of popularity, on power, on happiness? Where are you? That's what he was asking him. And with the devil... When trials come, the devil wants to tell you all this negative so you can get mad at God. Remember Satan and Job and God? Satan said, God, if you take everything away from Job, a trial, all his money, his house, his animals, even his family, if you take all that away, he'll curse you to your face. And God said, no, he won't. Satan took everything away from Job. And what did, God, what did Job say? Blessed I was. To uh, receive, blessed I am to give. God blessed me in the beginning, blessed me in the end. I came into this world naked, I leave naked. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's what your choice. In a minute, we're going to pray and we're going to take communion. My encouragement to you, God wants your pain. He wants your burden. He wants your questions. He wants your discouragement. It says, cast all your cares on me, Jesus said, because I care for you. That's what he said. He says, take, give me your burden, and you take my burden, and my burden is light. That's what he said. So we're going to pray. We're going to take communion. If you've never asked Christ to be your Savior, we want to give you that opportunity because you shouldn't take communion if Christ is not your Savior. So let's all bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for Joseph. I thank you for the detail of the story. That even though he went through traumatic experiences, he was still faithful to you. And you were faithful to him. Lord, there are people here today going through stuff, traumatic things. I pray they be faithful to their job, to the people that you put in their life, and most of all, to you. That we wouldn't use trials and hard times as an excuse to do what we want, to compromise our faith, our commitment to Christ. That we would acknowledge our need now more than ever to be faithful. If you realize today, yes, I need to surrender my life to Christ, I need to surrender my burdens to Christ, whether it is for salvation or just because you have burdens that you need Christ to take from you. Pray this prayer with me. Same prayer for both groups of people. Pray in the privacy of your heart. Dear God, I'm a sinner. I have burdens. I want to surrender to you. I believe Jesus died. For my sin, for my pain. 
I believe he rose. I believe he is the son of God. Dear Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. Please take over my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Please take my burden. Please take my pain. Please get me through. I want to start over today. My life with you. My commitment to you. I have no excuses. You're waiting for me, I know. So here I am. Thank you, Jesus. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer because you want to be saved, you prayed that prayer because you want to cast your burden on the Lord, just lift your hand up real high. We can see you and pray for you. Good, 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 good. Very good, very good, very good, very good, very good. Good, good. If you're in the lobby, if you're in Casa Real, we see you. Very good. God, God bless you. You can put your hands down. God bless you. Lord, we thank you for hope and expectant desire to experience your peace and love at a new level, even amidst hard times. We thank you for the hope that you will bless us even amidst hard times. And I pray right now as we take communion that we would be reminded of your death on the cross, how that, those two days of being tortured and those five days being tortured, crucified, buried, Lord, that week did not define who you are. It was only one piece of the puzzle. Thank God it was only one piece of the puzzle. And we thank you that as you walk through the valley of shadow of death, we will walk through the valley, the shadow of death. And with your presence and with us acknowledging your presence, we will fear no evil because you are with us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. As the ushers come forward to hand out the uh, communion, we want to ask you to hold the bread and hold the juice. And after, if you raise your hand, if you want prayer, we have people that want to pray with you. Or whatever you're dealing with, whether it's salvation, we want to talk to you. So after we take communion and sing, we want to ask you to come up and pray with us.